in the city of our God and in the mountain of his holiness. President Harvey, President Riddick, Executive Secretary, Reverend Dr. Hagens, and to everyone assembled, greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm excited about tonight, how about you? The Lord has allowed us another chance to come to the Minister's Conference as well as our Choir Directors Organist Guild Workshop. I just feel like giving God another praise. I'm, I'm, I'm just excited, I don't know about you, but I'm excited about what God is doing in this conference. Growing up in church, I sang on the Sunbeam Choir. How many have sang? All right, y'all know what I'm talking about, singing on the Sunbeam Choir. Amen. And I'm sure you know what little ones sang in the Sunbeam Choir. And there was a song that we used to sing, and it said, Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Remember that? Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see for the father up above is looking down in love so be careful little eyes what you see then we would tell the ears the same thing we would tell the tongue the same thing that song had a lot of truth in it don't you agree amen so tonight I want to share with you, oh, be careful little thoughts, what you think. Amen. Them thoughts can go everywhere, all kinds of ways. Paul gives us a good description on how and what to think on. He says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things that are true, whatsoever things that are honest, whatsoever things that are just, Whatsoever things that are pure, whatsoever things that are lovely, on how and what to think on. He says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things that are true, ah. whatsoever things that are honest, All right, preach. whatsoever things that are just, All right. whatsoever things that are pure, whatsoever things that are lovely, Isn't that exciting? <laughs> I heard myself. <laughs> Whatsoever things that are of good report, hallelujah. If there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Philippians 4 and 8. God is far more interested in changing your mind than changing your circumstances. We want God to take away all our problems, pain, sorrow, suffering, sickness, and sadness. But God wants to work on you first because transformation won't happen in your life until you renew your mind, until your thoughts begin to change. Manage your mind because your thoughts control your life. The power of your thoughts has tremendous ability to shape your life for good or bad. For example, maybe you accept the thought someone told you when you were growing up, you're worthless, you'll never amount to anything. If you accepted that thought, even though it was wrong, 
it really shaped your life. Manage your life, manage your mind, because the mind is the battleground for sin. The word tells us, be not conformed to this world, but be ye, all right, talk back to me, by the renewing of your mind. <laughs> One of the reasons why you get mentally fatigued is because there's a battle in your brain every tw all 24 hours a day. It's debilitating because it's intense, and it's because your mind is, a, is the greatest asset. Satan wants your greatest access. So manage your mind because it's the key to happiness. One, an unmanaged mind leads to tension. Two, a managed mind leads to tranquility. Three, an unmanaged mind leads to conflict. Four, an unmanaged mind leads to stress. And when you don't try to control your mind and the way you direct your thoughts, you will have an enormous amount of stress in your life. Am I helping somebody tonight? But a managed mind leads to strength, security, and serenity. Letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. Now here's the conclusion of all this. It says, build a wall of praise. Hallelujah. Build a wall of praise. Be happy in the Lord. Can you say amen? amen. Build a wall of patience accept others just as they are. Overlook how they act and what they do. This will also protect them from dwelling in negative areas. Build the wall of prayer. How many build the wall of prayer? Hallelujah. Stop worrying about the things you can't change. Lean on the Lord. So be careful little eyes, be careful little ears, be careful, little tongue, and be careful, little thoughts. What you see, what you hear, what you say, and what you think. For the Father up above is truly looking down in love. Feed your thoughts on the goodness of the Lord. Can you say amen? amen. Claim your mind back in the name of Jesus from the enemy. There are spiritual laws that demons must obey. Your power is in the name of, your power is in the blood of, your power is in the Holy Ghost. So when you say Satan, the Lord Jesus rebuke you. Satan will have to back up Hi, yeah, Jesus, in the name of Jesus and flee. He said, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they shall cast out devils. In my name, they shall speak with new tongue. In my name, they shall take up serpents. And in my name, they will drink no deadly thing. And in my name, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and in my name, they shall recover. Come on and help me call the name of Jesus. Jesus, in the name of, in the name of, God bless you. President Harvey, President Riddick, Vice President Connor, Chaplain Hagens, and other leaders of the Hampton Ministers Conference. My name is uh, Bobby Scott. I'm the Congressman representing the 3rd Congressional District of Virginia. And I want to welcome you to the 103rd Hampton University Ministers Conference and 80, 83rd Choir Directors and Organist Guild Workshop. Now, this conference has a rich history galvanizing African-American churches to help address the needs of our communities. Today, more than ever, we need to follow the message outlined in the 25th chapter of the book of Matthew, what you have done 
unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. And now, more than ever, we cannot ignore the needs of the least of these when it comes to food and housing and health care, the criminal justice system, education, jobs, and civil rights. The least of these have many needs, and we're in a position to do something about it. And so, pray for those who are elected officials, but hold them accountable. Uh, I wanna, so I want to welcome you. I want to welcome you again to this conference. Uh, remember that um, you have a lot of work to do. Uh, enjoy the conference and return to your homes invigorated, ready to do something to help the least of these. Thank you very much. And now, and now I want you to give a warm welcome to the distinguished mayor of the city of Hampton, Donnie Tuck. To Dr. Harvey, to Dr. Riddick, to Dr. Hagens, to Congressman Scott, to the officers of the Ministers' Conference, to ministers and attendees, on behalf of the Hampton City Council and the residents of this great city, I'd like to welcome you uh, to Hampton and to the 103rd Hampton University Ministers' Conference. As I thought about tonight, I think I first heard about the Ministers' Conference back in about 1978, 79, when I was living in Durham, North Carolina. And in June 1987, I drove a friend of mine who was a former pastor, Reverend Dr. Marcus Ingram of New Hope Missionary Baptist Church in Chatham County. I drove him up here uh, for the conference with the intention of staying uh, and at least going to one session, but I had to go back to Durham and missed it. And in 1992 or 93, I stood outside Ogden Hall with another pastor friend, uh, Reverend Dr. Irving Waters of Mount Hermon Temple in Portsmouth, Virginia, as we listened to uh, Reverend Dr. Gardner C. Taylor. And so I counted an honor that after 30 years, I finally have a seat on the inside of this great. <laughs> so I'd like to read to you a proclamation, and it says, City of Hampton, Virginia, proclamation proclaiming June 4th through 9th, 2017 as the 103rd Hampton University Ministers' Conference Week in the city of Hampton, Virginia. Whereas Hampton University will host the 103rd Annual Ministers' Conference at the Hampton University Communication Center in Hampton, Virginia on June 4th through 9th, 2017. Whereas the Ministers' Conference was first held June 29th through July 3rd, 1914, with 40 ministers representing four denominations gathered in the Memorial Church, whereas the welcoming clergy from all Christian denominations is what originally set Hampton's conference apart from the rest and has led to the success seen today. Whereas the ministers' conference in its second year adopted the title of the Ministers' Conference of Hampton Institute later the Hampton University Ministers' Conference, and spread beyond the Hampton Roads area to include Richmond and Roanoke, Virginia. Whereas, according to a report by Finninger, the annual conference was to be, quote, held at the same time as the summer school for teachers with the hope that closer cooperation might be brought between ministers and teachers, end quote. And whereas the Hampton University Ministers' Conference and Choir Directors Guild and Organist Choir Directors and Organist Guild has welcomed famous individuals to the campus of Hampton University. Past attendees have included the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in 1962, the Reverend Wyatt T. Walker of Abyssinian Baptist Church in New York, the Reverend Jesse Jackson, the Reverend Al Sharpton, the Reverend T.D. Jakes, and former President Barack Obama in 2007, now, therefore, I, Donnie R. Tuck, Mayor, on behalf of the City Council of the City of Hampton, Virginia, do hereby proclaim June 4th through 9th, 2017, as the 103rd Hampton University Minister's Conference Week in the City of Hampton, and extend a very warm and cordial welcome to your entire group. 
Furthermore, I wish all of you a successful, enjoyable, and memorable conference, in witness whereof I hereunto set my hand and cause the seal of the city of Hampton, Virginia, to be affixed this fourth day of June, 2017. Thank you and welcome. Praise the Lord, everybody. <laughs> to President Harvey and President Riddick and Executive Director and Treasurer, Dr. Deborah Hagens, Reverend Dr. Deborah Hagens, and also President Dorsey of the Choir Directors Guild, past presidents, officers, and many other distinguished guests. My name is Reverend Jeff Wright, and I want to add my welcome to all of you and greet you in the name that's above every other name, the name of Jesus. Ephesians 2, 8 and 10 reminds us that we're saved by grace through faith, and it's not of ourselves, not of works. It's a gift of God, so we don't brag about it. And then verse 10 says, we're his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God before ordained that we should walk in them. One translator says, you're God's masterpiece, that he uniquely created you to do good work, which he planned in advance for you to do. So there's three critical decisions, the three most important decisions you'll make in your life are first, who you'll serve, which determines where you'll spend eternity, and secondly, who you're going to marry, which frames out your family structure and which we as black people in this country know have been intentionally under continuous attack since the day we stepped off the boat in 1619. But that third decision, what your life's work will be vocationally, what you're going to be doing Monday through Saturday with respect to the legacy that you're going to leave on this planet is also a critical one. And as pastors and ministers and leaders, we know our primary job is to be, up, is to be about leading people to Christ and helping to ensure their eternal security and that of our congregations. And then many of you, you've given counsel and officiated wedding ceremonies, laying a foundation for the families for centuries that have been disrupted. Yet that third decision is the one where we have a little ways to go. And even more pressing is the fact that this issue of theology of vocation and economics and community development will most likely determine whether we will be successful in passing the baton to the next generation. And why is this critical? Well, for obvious reasons, many of us are struggling in this room with how we reach our millennials and younger generations. And millennials of every ethnicity are the least engaged in the church, but yet they say their greatest concern is not knowing what to do with their lives or how their jobs and their work life connect to their faith. Well, right now, at the beginning of the 21st century, in the midst of this technological revolution, where we have a revolution that will surpass the industrial revolution or even have a greater impact on the world in Gutenberg Press, we believe at UMI, at Urban Ministries Incorporated, that the church should be the place where these masterpieces of God come together to find out what God created them for. And so the discipleship resources and the Sunday school and vacation Bible school and small group resources that we've been developing for you, we have begun to add content that can help you lead them to understand the connection between their work and their faith. We have a free resource kit, including sermon outlines, which we want you to go and sign up in a bookstore for. But we also encourage you to support the many speakers who will be bringing you content across this stage in this pulpit about all of the things that they're going to be sharing, all in a bookstore. In addition to that, Dr. Harvey has done an excellent book on leadership, which is available there. This free faith and work kit is available for you to sign up for. I hope that you have a blessed week this week. I know many of you are going to get encouragement that you need to keep going on, and we're right there with you. Don't forget to take some of it back with you. God bless you, and have a wonderful Hampton University Ministers Conference. Good evening, and uh, thanks to uh, President Harvey and President Riddick and all of you who have made the Hampton Ministers Conference an institution for 103 years. I'm Elder John William Templeton. I'm here on behalf of Black Wealth 2020. Uh, that website is blackwealth2020.com. I hope you come to see us at our booth 
uh, where we'll be giving away drawings for $10,000 worth of travel and books over the course of the week. But Black Wealth 2020 is a coalition of national organizations that have con come together because we are on the banks of the Red Sea economically. And we've come together because we've decided that it's time for us to get to the land of milk and honey. So we want you to come by and leave your card so that you, you can, we can find out how you can help. We have three goals. One is to increase the number of black homeowners, two million. The other is to increase the number of black owned businesses. And the third is to increase the ability of black owned banks to provide the capital that we need. There are 700,000 business loans in the United States. Only 10,000 of them went to African Americans. 60% of those were done by black owned banks. So the math is real simple. The more we help black owned banks, the more we support black businesses, the more we help our, our families get homes, the better off we're going to be. I look forward to meeting you. I'll be here all, all, all week through Friday. Thank you. Hallelujah. God is great and he's greatly to be praised. Amen. God is great and he's greatly to be praised. Anybody love Jesus? Come on, put your hands together. Give God a hand praise. We worship him and we honor him for who he is. Hallelujah. Listen, my God reign. Our God reign. Lord, you reign. My God reign, our God reign, Lord you reign, come on and say, what happens? You reign, say it again with
If you know he reigns, come on and give him praise all over this place tonight. Come on, let's exalt his name tonight. If he reigns in your circumstances, you want to give him praise in this place? My God reigns. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God and in the mountain of his holiness. I was glad when they said unto me, come, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. By the grace and mercy of God, it is my happy privilege and pleasure to call to order the 103rd annual gathering of the Hampton University Ministers Conference. Come on, let's put those hands together and give God the glory. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the, are there any praises in the house? Anybody glad to be in the house of the Lord one more time? Hallelujah, hallelujah. It's Hampton time, amen. We don't know if you came by train, by boat, by plane, but you made it here in Jesus' name. Turn and tell somebody, I'm so glad I'm here in Jesus' name. Now put those hands together and give God the praise tonight. Hallelujah. We are so delighted to be at Hampton. Amen. What a privilege, what an honor it is to be with you, to be before you. This is my 37th year coming to Hampton, and I am so glad to be here. You may be seated in his presence, and we give God the glory. Amen. A few years ago, I was president of this conference, and I remember having those two little boys here tomorrow. The youngest is going to be graduating from Princeton University, and so we are so excited. He said, Mom, you can come if you promise not to cry and scream. I said, I'm going to cry and scream, and I'm going to be there. Amen. 
$250,000 later. Come on, somebody. Last tuition payments. Come on, somebody. So yours may have been a mortgage payment. Yours may have been a rent payment. Yours may have been another kind of payment, but you're so glad because Jesus got us through. Is that right? And we're glad to be here in Jesus' name. We want to rise and shine and give God the glory. So our first hymn tonight is going to be To God Be the Glory. This year we have a special book. All the hymns and everything are in our book. So all you have to do is flip to the back of the book to hymn number three. And our first hymn is To God Be the Glory for the great things he has done. Let's welcome Omar Dickinson and our choir as they lead us. Won't we stand together and sing To God be the glory. Won't you stand all over the church? Amen. God's word. Sometimes he gave leaders to take them through 40 years of wilderness, and then other times there were leaders who helped them stabilize for 40 years. For almost 40 years, we've had a leader we could be proud of. I came from that generation where we wanted to make our people proud, represent, as they say, and we are so proud of the leader of this institution all over the land. I see commercials about their Proton Institute. I see commercials about Hampton University. We want to welcome and receive the president of the Hampton University. Won't you welcome Rev. Dr. William Harvey.
Thank you, thank you, thank you to Dr. Riddick, uh, Dr. Hagens, all of the past presidents of the Hampton University Ministers Conference, former U.S. Ambassador, Dr. Susan Johnson Cook, the first female president. of the Hampton University Ministers Con uh, Conference, Dr. Uh, Congressman Bobby Scott, Mayor Tuck, Commonwealth Attorney Anton Bell, who's sitting in my seat over here, who's also a, a uh, minister and the Commonwealth's attorney here. I tell folk about all of the elected officials that support you. You gotta make sure that you support them as well. You know, we got to make sure that uh, uh, we support our common interests. To the ministers as well, to the choir directors and members, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to Hampton University. I want you to know that I've had the absolute pleasure for 39 years to welcome you to this minister's conference. And for the 103rd, I offer you well warm greetings on behalf of Hampton University. I am so pleased that as I look around, so many of you have chosen to participate in the 103rd Hampton University Ministers Conference and the 83rd Choir Directors and Organist Guild Workshop. Each of you each of you present has selected to attend the conference because of your desire to advance your ministry. This year's theme, practicing preaching forward, forward preaching, prophetic preaching is appropriate for the times that we live in. And I want to give you all a bit of my personal testimony I want, to, want you to know that the Lord has blessed me to be able to provide leadership for 39 years, the longest tenured president at an HBCU and one of the longest tenured in the country. And next year, next month, as I began my 40th year as president, I recognize the importance of the word forward, and it is my responsibility to move this wonderful institution forward. My recently released book, Principles of Leadership, The Harvey Leadership Model, outlines those leadership principles that I have practiced during my entire tenure here at Hampton. And one of those principles is courage. By exercising courage, I have been able to dream no small dreams. I want you to know that dreaming no small dreams is a mantra that I have lived by during my entire tenure at Hampton. This mantra is applied to all that we do, including hosting this outstanding, wonderful minister's conference. It is a mantra that I use when we made the decision to build the Hampton University Proton Beam uh, Cancer uh, Institute. Although a lot of factors were involved uh, in establishing it, fighting cancer and saving lives was always in the forefront of my thinking. When we began our journey, there were only three in the country. Now, I want you to listen to this They've got them now at the University of Pennsylvania, University of Florida, Johns Hopkins, the Mayo Clinic is building two, uh, Georgetown University, all of them came after us, okay? <laughs> Hampton was forward thinking when we defied the odds in opening our center. People said you were a a uh, modest size university. People said that you were a black university. And so, so why are you doing this? I said, why not? Okay? <laughs> Using modern technology, we are treating prostate, breast, lung, ocular, 
pediatrics, spine, head, neck, and brain cancers. And in the process, we are the largest freestanding proton cancer treatment in the world. I'm sharing this with you now at this audience because I think it's appropriate. Many people do not recognize how deeply cancer affects our very society. You either have had it yourself, your family member has had it, your neighbor, your friend, your colleague, somebody. Cancer affects all of us. And I'll say this to you. According to the American Cancer Society, African Americans have the highest, I'll repeat that, highest death rate and the shortest survival rate of any racial or ethnic group in the entire United States of America. And I say this to my male colleagues. Black men have a 70% higher incident rate of prostate cancer than do white men. And I say this to my female friends. Make your man go to the doctor. Make him go to the doctor. I want to tell you that in addition to have the, having the highest incidence rate, black men have the highest mortality rate of prostate cancer. Now let me tell you something else. Prostate cancer can be 100% cured, not 99, 100% cured if you catch it early. But in order to catch it early, you got to get your PSA, you got to get that digital exam, and we're among friends here now, because some of us men say, I don't want nobody sticking their finger in, you know. <laughs> well, I tell you what, I tell you what, you better let that doctor do that because it can absolutely save your life. What is most important for you to know and gain from what I've shared is through embracing the concept of forward. Hampton University discovered another means of being service to mankind. We invite you to help us carry out this mission. There's information in your program and there's a, 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 pro, uh, there's a program out front. Get it, share it, because cancer is so devastating, but it can be cured. At various points in one's life, it is necessary to focus on what is in front of us and to, uh, uh, to, to commit to moving forward. Although it is important to know our past, we certainly cannot allow our past to stifle us and keep us from moving forward. Now is the time for all of us to move forward. Please take advantage of all of the offerings at this year's conference. The wisdom and knowledge you receive will challenge you to change. And it is my hope that by the time you leave these hallowed grounds, a place we affectionately call our home by the sea, you will be prepared for preaching forward, forward preaching, and prophetic preaching. I want you to know that uh, as I get ready to enter my 40th year as the leader of this institution, I consider you one of mine, too. So welcome, and God bless you. Thank you so much, Dr. Harvey, for hosting us by this Home by the Sea. Come on, let's give some love to Dr. Harvey one more time. Thank you for the courage and the charisma and you know, having been a president, it takes a lot to keep this going. All year long, the officers are working with the university to make sure that every I is dotted, every T is crossed, that your registration may go well, that all the rides that are necessary, the parking, there are lots of intricate details. And so for representing Hampton University, who is our executive minister and our treasurer, 
is Dr. Deborah Higgins. Now I want you to not only applaud for her doing the work, but since we were last together, she got her PhD in pastoral counseling. Come on, let's give it up for Reverend Deborah. Got it going on. PhD, Dr. Higgins. Come on, let's give it up for her. As I say to everyone, it's just way, way too much. But thank you so very much. Good evening, everyone. And on behalf of the officers of Hampton University Ministers Conference, Choir Directors and Organists Guild, let me begin by just saying hello and welcome. Welcome to the 103rd and the 83rd annual session, respectively. I'm glad you're here. We're glad you arrived safely, and please feel free to enjoy your home by the sea. You are my top priority this week. Your rest, your revitalization, your revival, and your renewal is my utmost uh, mission this week, because we all need to have spiritual refreshing. Everything, every living thing goes through renewal, a renewal process. We download so that we might upgrade, even our phones and our iPads. You know, every once in a while, we get a notification from an iOS system that there is a need to install an upgrade. At that time, we go to the settings icon, press download update, and the little wheels begin to turn or the bar begins to race across the screen as the internal system prepares itself for an update. However, sometimes we get an error message that says, in order to complete the update, your phones need to have at least 50% power. Connect your, your phone to a power source. And so the power source continues to feed and give power to your phone so that the internal mechanism, so that the system won't operate at a deficit. If you have come to Hampton and are operating with less than 50% power, you're in the right place. So what does God do? He delivers each of you safely to Hampton University for an upgrade, to plug in for more power to connect one-on-one -on -one with a power source that is greater than yourself. But the one who really helped me was the one God pulled by his hair and dropped him off at his next assignment. It was Ezekiel who was the progenitor of a prophetic upgrade. I found the law of worship tucked inside the oracles of Ezekiel, the 46th chapter and the ninth verse. And it goes a little something like this, depending upon your favorite version of the Holy Writ. When the people of the land, that's you and me, come before the Lord at the appointed time, here it is. Whoever enters by the north gate to worship is to go out the south gate. And whoever enters by the south gate is to go out by the north gate. And here is the mandate, but no one is to return through the gate by which you entered. No one. May I conclude this invitation of a welcome with a familiar colloquialism of the African American church? It's interpreted like this. You cannot leave here like you came, in Jesus' name. This is Ezekiel's law of worship. It does not need to pass the House or the Senate. It does not need a vote of Congress. And it is a law that cannot be repealed or replaced. So I welcome you to make up your mind according to the prophetic oracle of Ezekiel and make up your mind that you will not leave here like you came. So if you feel like you need a change or an update or an upgrade, I want you to stand on your feet and I want you to tell somebody that I won't leave here like I came in Jesus' name. Find about five people and tell them I won't leave here like I came in Jesus' name. It is the law of worship. It is the mandate upon every life that I won't leave here like I came. Welcome to Hampton University. I don't 
don't know about you, but I'm not going out the same gate. I'm not going out the same way I came in. I came to be excited, ignited, and I am delighted in Jesus' name. Turn to tell two people, I'm so glad I'm here. In Jesus' name. Gonna pray while I'm here. In Jesus' name. Gonna sing while I'm here. In Jesus' name. Come on, say hallelujah. There's going to be a change up in here tonight. Amen. If you're able, please take your seats. Amen. How many came in here operating on less than 50%? Turn and tell somebody, excuse me. I feel a praise coming on. Excuse me. I feel 60% coming. I feel 70% coming. Eat it. 90, come on, get your plays on.
Won't he do it? Yes, he will. Won't he do it? Yes, he will. Can he do it? Yes, he can. Just say, woo! Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Please take your seats if you can. Woo! Some of y'all came in with less than 50%, but how many are up to about 80 right now? Amen, amen. You know, I, um, in New York, I used to be a police chaplain, and uh, whenever there was a dead body or a body that looked like it was dead, they would call both the police department chaplains and they call the EMT emergency medical technicians because they weren't sure whether they were dead or alive. So if they were dead, we were gonna do a prayer over them, their last rites, and if they were still alive, they could feel their pulse and they could put our lifeline in and get them where they needed help. So this is what I need you to do. I need you to just um, take the wrist of the person who's ever closest to you and just check their pulse right now. If they're DOA, you can change your seat because this is not a cemetery. This is a sanctuary. Is there anybody here that loves my Jesus? Anybody here that loves my Lord? Say, I'm alive! Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Amen. I feel some praises in the house tonight. Amen. To lead us further in worship, this is what we're going to do. We're going to sing a hymn of praise, number two. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. How many know he's sweet? Just to take him at his word. And following the hymn of praise, then we're going to have a prayer. And tonight our prayer is going to be from Reverend Dr. Stanley Kimball. And he's the pastor of the New Smyrna Baptist Church in Fort Valley, Georgia. Say hey, hello. And following that, the scripture reading is going to be Dr. Angelo Chapman, who's the pastor of Pilgrim Journey Baptist Church in Richmond, Virginia. And he's also the university chaplain at Virginia Union. So we'll have it in that order. Tis so sweet. Are some Virginians in the house? Are some Georgians in the house? Are some Jesus folk up in the house? Okay, okay, yeah, all right, hold on, hold on, hold on, one second, one second, let's, that was a good, yeah, bad rehearsal, let's start again.
Paul and Silas proved that if we just trust him, he can make a way out of no way. May we pray. O oh God of our weary years, O oh God of our silent tears, Thou who has brought us thus far on this way. We pause at this moment in time to say thank you, O oh God, for being God in each and every one of our lives. We say thank you, O oh God, for being our way maker. We say thank you, O oh God, for leading, guiding, and directing us. And as we come on this night, O oh God, we thank you, O oh God, for this prophetic preaching conference. We thank you for its early beginning in Ogden Hall. And we thank you, O oh God, for its transforming existence over 103 years. Dear God, we thank you for the sacrifices that brought all of us here. We thank you, O oh God, for people pouring into us. We thank you for great preachers, great theologians, great thinkers, O oh God. But most of all, dear God, we thank you for our calling. We thank you, O oh God, for sending us on a lifelong mission. And as we come on this night, O oh God, we must say we just thank you. Dear God, we give you hallelujah praise. For just like Israel, we realize that if it had not been for the Lord who was on our side, thank you, O oh God, that even in challenging times, you are on our side. Help us, dear God, as we come to this our home by the sea for this week. Help us, dear God, to become better proclaimers of the gospel. Help us, O oh God, to be better preachers when we leave than what we were and we came. Dear God, give us a word for more than 24 million people who stand almost in need of health care. Give us a word, oh God, for budget cuts and other things that hurt our people. Give us a word this day, oh God, to liberate our people during this time. Bless the one, oh God, who must stand and preach on this night. Dear God, let him preach just like Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. Dear God, with the isms and challenges of this world, oh God, let him come and preach Jesus. For if he just preached Jesus, I have a feeling that everything will be all right. Bless us. Keep us. Feel this building with your presence. For if you fill it with your presence, oh God, it will fill all of us. It's in the name of Jesus the Christ we pray. It's in the name of Mary's baby we pray. It's in the name of the one who took two fish, five barley loaves, and fed more than 5,000. It's in the name of the one who got up early one Sunday morning and said, I got this. I got all power in my hands. In the name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. And the church said, Amen.
Shall we center our spirits as we put voice to text? Out of the second chapter of the book of Joel, beginning at the 15th verse and proceeding through the 25th, we find these words. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Appoint a solemn fast. Proclaim a day of abstinence. Gather the people together. Appoint a solemn assembly. Summon the elders. Gather the children, even the babies at their mother's breast. Bid the bridegroom leave his wedding chamber and the bride her bower. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, stand weeping between the porch and the altar and say, spare your people, Lord. Do not expose your own people to insult, to be made a byword by other nations. Why should the people say, where is their God? Then the Lord showed his ardent love for his land and was moved with compassion for his people. And he answered their appeal and said, I shall send you corn, new wine and oil, and you will have them in plenty. I shall expose you no longer to be the reproach of other nations. I shall remove the northern peril from you and banish it to the land arid and wasteful, the vanguard into the eastern sea, the rear guard into the western sea. The stench and foul smell of it will go up. He has done great things. So, earth, don't be afraid, but rejoice and be glad. For the Lord has done great things. Fear not, you beast of the field. For the open pastures will be green. The trees will bear fruit. The fig and the vine will yield their harvest. Rejoice, O people of Zion. Be glad in the Lord your God, who gives you food in the due season by sending you rain the autumn and the spring rains as in times of old. The threshing floors will be heaped with grain. The vats will overflow with new wine and oil. And I shall recompense you. And I shall recompense you. And I shall recompense you for the years that the swarmer has eaten the hopper and the grub and the locust, my great army, which I sent against you. And now, may the revelation of God emerge through the words of this text, written, read, and soon to be preached by our president in the name of the Lord.
coming to Hampton, you know it's not just a conference, it's an experience. Am I right about it? How many came when we all fit into the chapel years ago? How many joined us when we were in Ogden Hall? It was hot and sweaty, but it was so much fun. And then how many have been coming since we moved to the Convocation Center? And God has been good and glorious. And all through that, on the stage here are the current officers and leadership. We have in the back row Dr. A.C. D. Vaughn, who's one of the fathers of the faith. In the front row, Dr. Robert Perry, one of the fathers of the faith. You can give them some love. And what happens as we are officers, we actually become a family. You learn a lot from your predecessors, those who went before you, those who walk with you. And we thank God. Bishop Thomas was the one who was before me and taught me so much. And in our cabinet, the year that I became president was a man who was the necrologist, his direct, Dr. Dwight Riddick. And you want to see them succeed because they've been so faithful and loyal to you. When I was president, he made sure my transportation and all behind the scenes things were good. He made sure his family made sure my hair was together. You know, the sister had to have her hair together. Come on, somebody. And he made sure that our family on this stage was intact. But I've also watched him since he's been in leadership, and I've watched him how he deals with his biological family. And so tonight to introduce him is his daughter in love, Janelle Riddick, who's married to his son, Dwight Sherrod Riddick. I've seen them, how they flow together, how they grow together. Her husband last year received his doctorate in preaching from the University of Chicago, and she is now a third year student in the University of Chicago. So here to introduce her father in love is Reverend Janelle Riddick. Can we receive her tonight? Dr. Harvey, officers, past presidents, each of you who share in the weight and the wonder of ministry, brothers and sisters in Christ, I greet you tonight in the wonderful name of Jesus. It is my sincere honor to introduce our proclaimer for the evening, the 40th president of the Hampton University Ministers Conference, the Reverend Dr. Dwight Riddick, Sr. As one peruses his biography, it is remarkable to note one who was celebrated and honored in numerous arenas and has made an indelible impact every place the soles of his feet have tread. Academically, he earned a BA degree from Norfolk State University. He then matriculated through the hallowed halls of the Samuel D. Witt Proctor School of Theology at Virginia Union University. A lifelong learner, he has earned two doctoral degrees, one from Regent University and a subsequent from the Chicago Theological Seminary. He has been the honored pastor of the great people of the Gethsemane Baptist Church for over 33 years. Gethsemane is in the house. He is the celebrated husband of his partner in life and ministry, his rose in the garden of Gethsemane, the vivacious Vera Riddick. He is the honored father of two adult children, the Reverend Dr. Dwight Riddick II, amen and Tiffany Foreman, along with her husband Mitchell, who all share in kingdom building. And we dare not forget the fabulous five grandchildren whose faces light up each time their g walks in the room. He is the author of the acclaimed work, Does Preaching Have a Future? A Call to Join the Conversation. In my humble estimation, preaching unequivocally has a future as men and women model the tremendous example of Dr. Riddick. The example of integrity intertwined with insight, honor hooked with humility, power paired with pragmatism, and passion partnered with the prophetic. Lester Roloff contends that the world's greatest need is preaching preachers. 
He further asserts that the gospel is our emancipation proclamation. And if this is true, Dr. Riddick has preached to set many souls free. He has preached to reinstill hope to the weary. He has preached recovery of sight to those eyes blinded by society's ills. He has preached to open the eyes of those rocked to sleep amid racism and moral collapse. He has preached to awaken those in a spiritual coma of convenience and complacency. And tonight, he will preach. Our dad, pastor, friend, mentor, our president. He will preach as he has pressed his ear to the lips of the Father and will serve as heaven's postman to deliver us a word from glory. After this choir shall come and lift their voices once again, let us with great anticipation welcome our president, the Reverend Dr. Dwight Riddick Sr.
Bless you as you go to your seats. We honor the very presence of the Lord tonight, the presence of the Holy Spirit, who have once again orchestrated our steps and brought us together in this glorious and this hallowed place. What a joy and what a privilege it is to be at our home by the sea. The Lord has been good to us, has kept us another 12 months, and here we are one more time. Dr. William Harvey, president of this fine university, Reverend Dr. Deborah Hagens. To all of the officers, to the past presidents, Mr. Omar Dickerson, to the Reverend Constance Darcy, president of the Choir Directors Guild and Organist Guild Workshop, to all of the presenters who are scheduled to share with us throughout this entire week, to my many friends and well wishes, all of those who've been praying for me all year long. Amen. Congressman Bobby Scott. To my church family that's here tonight, the greatest church on this side of Jordan, the Gethsemane Baptist Church, leadership team, and all of our members. To all of my family who've gathered tonight in particular, my children and five grandchildren, and then finally to my lovely wife tonight, we certainly thank God for each of you. We thank God for another opportunity to be here tonight and to share in this setting. The Lord has been mighty good to us and brought us from a mighty long way. We gather this week under the banner of forward preaching, preaching forward, prophetic preaching. The text has been read in your hearing tonight, and as the Spirit of the Lord should lead and guide, I'll read just two of the verses, the beginning verse and the ending verse, verse 15 and verse number 25. The New Revised Standard Version, the book of Joel, chapter 2, verse number 15, Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the age, gather the children, even infants, at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her canopy. And that final verse, it simply says this. We hear the words of God who himself says, I will repay you for the years 
that the swarming locusts have eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army which I sent against you. As the Spirit of the Lord shall lead and guide tonight, I want to talk about recovering the role of prophetic preaching. Recovering the role of prophetic preaching. Printed between the covers of the May 19 to 84 National Geographic magazine, a horrific scenes that might appropriately offer this disclosure, warning, viewer discretion advised. The content of that publication consists of colorful photos and drawings reflecting the swift and dreadful destruction that wiped out the Roman city of Pompeii. Printed upon those pages are the images of a dead corpse, skeletal human and animal remains. And worst of all, imprinted in the stones are outlined the bodies of innocent little children. The thriving European vacation destination, the Las Vegas of that day, if you will, was located at the base of Mount Vesicerus. After centuries of dormancy, the peak of the mountain exploded about midday on August 24, 79 AD. It was one of the most catastrophic volcanic eruptions in history. In fact, ancient historians learned about the blast from the eyewitness account of Plenty the Younger, who was a Roman administrator and poet who stated that the explosion was so sudden and extensive that the residents were executed while in the midst of their daily routines. Men and women were shopping at the marketplace. The rich were enjoying their luxurious baths. The slaves were toiling and children were playing in the streets. They all died among a deadly cloud of tephoral and gases molten rocks, pulverizing pumice, and hot ash. Nearly two centuries later, archaeologists discovered that the eruption of the volcano was like a two-sided corn. On one side, it caused the people to perish. And yet, on the other side, it left traces of a culture and lifestyle that was now stuck in volcanic ashes, thus making the city of Pompeii a city frozen in time. But the saddest part of the entire ordeal was not the sudden upsurge of the volcanic gases, the falling of the ashes, the running of the lava, but rather it was the needless demise of the residents who lived in the city. According to the experts, those who died that day didn't have to die. Scientists affirm and reports that weeks of rumblings and shakings preceded the actual explosion and eruption. Though the invention of many tools that could monitor earthquakes had not yet been created, while satellites and cameras that measure the heat of the Earth's surface were not yet thought of, researchers confirmed that several days before the volcano erupted, there were clear, visible signs of clouds of smoke rising from the mountain. Regrettably, though there were shaking and rumblings and the presence of a smoking cloud, there's a group of people who went about their normal, de their normal daily routine, ignoring or unwilling to acknowledge and respond to the warning at hand. The people perish needlessly. Consequently, their legacy has been that of one that has been stuck in time. Reflections upon the legend of Pompeii points us to the scene of our text. Before us tonight, is another ancient city located in the mountains. It's the hill country of Judah. The nation of Judah is on the verge 
of experiencing a horrific and ter a terrible event. While facing what could be a catastrophic moment, like the city of Pompeii, Judah also received a vivid warning. Of course, the warning sign was not an earthquake. The warning sign was not the ascending of smoke from the mountaintop, but it did come in the form of a natural disaster. The report says that the land fell prey to an attack of swarming locusts. The locust invasion came in the form of four consecutive attacks, each worse than the previous. The first came the cutting locust. The cutting locust cut down everything in its path. What the cutting locust left, the swarming locust ate. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust ate. What the hopping locust left, the destroying locust ate. Given the fact that Judah was an agricultural company, these invasions were tragic. All the labor of the past now was for nothing. Their crops were destroyed. Their pastures left barren. The flocks and the herds perished for lack of water and food. The tiny creatures filled the sky. They blocked the sunlight, thus creating a kind of eclipse upon the city for miles. The noise of the wings were terrifying sounding like a burning fire to destroy a forest. In a brief half an hour, every green leaf and blade in the country was consumed. The land looked like a war zone. Strange, isn't it? How something so small could have such a huge impact. The invasion of a locust created a shaking made a rumbling, sent signs of smoke among the people of Judah. The locusts were sent as a warning sign. Yet the word is that Judah continued with business as usual. Here's a nation left in poverty, but still they've missed the warning. A people living a painful existence, but yet they've ignored the warning. Tribes terrified by their trials, but they have no intentions of making any changes. Folk who always complain about the condition that they were in, but fail to correct their ways. Consequently, they fell into a deep depression, started feeling sorry for themselves. The locust infestation affected their economic stability. But that's not all that the locusts did. It also sent shockwaves through the spiritual community. The people began to bemoan. We have no new wine, no figs, no wheat, no barley, no pomegranates, no dates, no apples, nothing that could be used to even make an offering unto our God. In light of all that they were experiencing, for one reason or another. It never dawned on them that the things that were happening to them and around them was God's way of trying to get their attention. But they failed to heed the warning. And while we are a nation with warning signs on every product, and while we are a nation with warning signs in every building, and while we are a nation with warning signs in every place, the absurdity is that we can see so many warnings until we fail to take them serious. I am afraid that the people, uh, that the people in the 21st century in America are like the people in Judah then. We're going about our normal everyday life with business as usual perhaps feeling a bit overwhelmed, somewhat perplexed, while at the same time, warning signs are going off all around us. The alarm is sounding. 
because there's almost an eruption that's about to take place but we are ignoring the warning who in here has sensed a shaking lately who in this place has heard a rumbling who in this place has seen or smelled the scent of smoke have you and I not become eyewitnesses to the present day events that ought to get our attention events that we have seen or experienced whether physically or remotely through the news reports Instagram on Facebook Twitter repeatedly we are immersed into the pain and the suffering that shakes the very fabric of our foundation I've come by Hampton to declare tonight that there's a rumbling going on perhaps starting with the faulty support structures that failed to hold back the flood waters at the onslaught of Hurricane Katrina along the Gulf Coast followed by, followed by Hurricane Sandy along the borders of New York. What about the toxic waters in Flint, Michigan? The once thriving city and home of the nation's largest General Motor Assembly plant. I feel like there's a rumbling going on right here in America one of the richest nations in the world yet there is a report that there are 42 million people facing hunger daily 13 million who are children and 5.7 million who are our seniors and hunger does not look these days like it used to the picture today is quite different as we are told that millions of working class americans do not know where their next meal is coming from Another article in the National Geographic's report that our nation's richest land where many farmers grow corn and soybean used to feed livestock to make cooking oil to produce sweetness, they themselves are going hungry. Cities like Houston, Texas are plagued with neighborhoods where there are working families who cannot afford to buy food. Hunger is growing faster in America's suburbs than its cities over the past decades creating what some have labeled as a class of the SUV poor. And what about urban neighborhoods where, where unemployment is pervasive, poverty constantly grows, and then we turn around and fire cafeteria workers who dares to give extra food to hungry students who do not have money to buy lunch. I tell you, I feel a rumbling and sense that there's some smoke in the air. Our elderly who pride themselves in capturing the American dream purchase their homes in nice neighborhoods. Now they've turned into war zone. Many of them who sat in the comfort of our pews on Sunday mornings are afraid to sit on their porches on Sunday evenings for fear of stray bullets released from gangs and gun members. Most tragic is that when the sun sets in the evening, many of them feel more secure sleeping in a hard bathtub rather than in the comforts of their own beds. I suggest tonight that there is a smoke screen going on in our nation, a shaking and a rumbling, not to mention the surge of strange but now familiar bullets that are often fired upon armless individuals by those who wear a blue uniform. How many of our loved ones have been killed by the very ones who have taken the oath to protect us? And then we have this term that is called the miscarriage of justice. We know them, don't we? We can call the roll. Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Eric Gardner, and the list goes on and on. What about mass incarceration? As the United States has the highest incarceration rate in the world with over 1.6 million individuals in prison. And that's a disproportionate number of African Americans. And then we're told that one in nine black children that you may pass on the street have even had or have a parent in prison. We feel the shaking, don't we? All around us, one thing after another. Several weeks ago, Congressman Scott and Senator Tim Kaine asked for space in our church building to hold a town hall meeting. This was shortly after the report came that a Russian spy ship was seen just 40 miles off the east coast of the United States. 
In that meeting, there was a middle-aged woman who stood up in the crowd, trembling with her tear, with tears in her eyes, shouting, I'm scared. I do not know what to do. And then to add insult to injury, how many of us in here found it hard to sleep following the results of a 2016 presidential election that when the electoral college declared that the 45th president of the United States would be somebody that you and I never expected to win. I tell you, there's a shaking going on. And while there's a shaking and a rumbling going on, perhaps many around the globe and many in our own nation have fallen asleep unmoved and numb going about business as usual this is exactly where judah was warning was within arm's reach but she reacted as though the everyday problems in the city was normal so judah ignored the warning and while they were ignoring the warning god was taking notice so much so until the text says he sent with a shaking and disturbing message his prophet interesting however is the person god chooses and sends he selects someone to represent him who was unknown unheard of unfamiliar to the faith community he chooses a guy by the name of joel now we don't know a lot about him. We don't know where he come from, nor anything at all about his credentials. All we know is that he showed up on the scene. We don't know anything at all about his lineage like we do about the lineage of David. No one says anything about him in terms of who begot who. He just comes with a one line resume without letters and recommendation. He merely introduces himself as Joel, the son of Bethuel. We may assume that he comes from Judah, but we do not know for sure. We have no record of his calling like we have of that of the prophet Isaiah, who said that in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Nor do we have any record of his training like that of the prophet Jeremiah who went down to the potter's house. We do not have witnesses of any place he ever preached. In fact, for all we know, this might even be his initial sermon. He just shows up on the scene. He's not been on the national circuit. We have not heard about him conducting revivals. We could not even find a transcript of where he attended seminary. His name is not on the front of a building or a marquee. Doesn't even have a Facebook page. And when you Google him, the only thing that pops up is his name. But his name says it all. For you see, God has a strange way of sometimes choosing and electing and selecting the very people that you and I would not choose. God has a track record of going into the hedges and the highways, on the back streets and back deserts, in backyards and sheep pastures, under oak trees, and handpicking the whosoever will he desires. Picks people with a questionable past, a shaky character, a small stature, and a slurred speech. I know I'm right about that because if the truth be told, a whole lot of us who are in here tonight have come from humble beginnings. We're not, we were not necessarily on somebody else's radar. We were not destined to be in front, in charge, on stage, in charge of anything. And yet we're serving in places and people that we never thought we would serve. And we're not there because people put us there. We're there because God looked somewhere when nobody else would take a chance on us and decide to call us. Look at some of us tonight working on jobs that other folks said we were unqualified for. Owning things the world said we would never have. Looking back over our lives, 
all you and I can shout tonight is Joel, which means God is Jehovah. That's what Joel, Joel means. Jehovah is God. And whose testimony is that tonight? They said you wouldn't make it. They said you was not entitled. They said you didn't come from the right side of the track. But tonight your testimony is that Jehovah is God. Ought to have somebody tonight who can say that's my name. My name is Joel. Because when I look back over my life, my only claim to fame is that God is Jehovah. He is the one who's made a way out of no way. And all I can say tonight is that if it had not been for the Lord who's on my side, somebody ought to shout tonight, my name is Joel. God is Jehovah. Joel, his name says it all. And he comes on the scene and gives a prophetic proclamation. Joel's work seems to fit in what Lenora Tubbs Tisdale writes in a Yale publication entitled Reflection, quoting from Walter Brueggemann's classic book, Prophetic, Prophetic Imagination. Brueggemann writes, the task of prophetic ministry is to nurture, nourish, and evoke a consciousness and perception alternative to the conscious and perception of the dominant culture around us. He also reminds us that while the first task of the biblical prophet was to criticize the old order, their second task is to energize the hearers with a hope-filled vision of a new reign of God that was to come. The Old Testament prophets were interpreters of history's lessons about moral and spiritual issues. They were seers, men who knew the condition of their present world. And in light of what they saw, they denounced or instructed people about their way of life. It was a woman by the name of Brenda Walsh who says that prophetic preaching calls us to challenge the status quo pointing out where things have gone wrong, bringing God's vision for our world to the forefront and pointing out how ordinary people of all ages and conditions can become involved and be a part of the solution. They had an understanding of the past and the present and when dipped into the future to foretell the impending judgment of God. Prophetic Preaching serves in helping the preacher to properly diagnose the ills of our present age as seen through heavenly eyes. And I want to suggest tonight when I read this text that this is exactly what the prophet Joel does. Mind you, he's a minor prophet, but he comes with a major word. Now, what really messed me up? is that Joel shows up. He comes with a word from the law. But it's where he goes that gets my attention. He does not go to the public square. He does not stand on the steps of the king's palace. He does not go to the halls of academia, nor does he make a trip to city hall. That's where I would have gone. That's where I would have expected the prophet to show up with his message. I would have expected him to address the politicians, to speak truth to power. But a careful reading of the text suggests that when Joel got ready to deliver the word God gave him, guess where he showed up? He showed up at the minister's conference. Chapter 1, verse number 13 bears me out. For it says, the people that Joel addressed were the priests and the ministers at the altar. He says to them, you've been blaming the devastation, the infestation of the locusts on the fact that the locusts came. He said to them, the locust has just come to shake some things up. He says, the locust represents a rumbling, 
the locust is has a smoke sign and the only reason the locust came was simply to send a warning he says the issue is not necessarily the locust but rather the issue is your loyalty to the law the issue is that the priest has been leading worship but God says the people have wondered. The priest has pronounced the doxology. But God says the people have departed and drifted away from me. The priest were offering sacrifice unto God. But while the priest was offering sacrifice unto God, the people had become sacrilegious. Thus, maybe the reason they missed the warning sign is that they were so far from God until they could not recognize him when he showed up in their midst. God then chooses an outsider, someone who's not a part of the religious structure, someone who is not a part of the religious order, someone who's not a member of the religious organization to come along and shake up the establishment. You do understand that every now and then, those of us who are on the inside and who are up close to matters oftentimes find it difficult to see things as they really are. One author in his handbook on adult development talks about the fact that the eye cannot see itself. And you can't ask a fish about water. That there are times when you cannot notice your surroundings because you are immersed and consumed by it. Therefore, it is not until we are ejected from the water or someone or something from the outside enters our environment and emerges with a sounding and resounding word. That's what happens in the text. God chooses someone without a name, someone without reputation, Someone the people do not know. Someone who's not a part of the establishment sends him to announce that Judah has drifted in her devotion. Her problem was not the locust. Her problem was her devotion. And one cannot help but wonder whether or not America has drifted from God. We print on our currency in God we trust. But our trust seemingly has diminished. Has America drifted from God? Better yet, has black America drifted from God? Deeper, has the black church drifted from God? And maybe the critical question tonight is, have, is has African American preaching drifted when it comes to prophetic proclamation? Marvin A. McMichael has given a title to his published work in the form of an interrogative that may very well be fitting and appropriate for these times. He's raised the question, where have all the prophets gone? He asks, what happened to the legacy of Vernon Johns, Martin Luther King Jr., Howard Thurman, Samuel Proctor, Adam Clayton Powell Jr., James Lawson? Where are the successors of Richard Allen, Nanny Helen Burroughs, Fanny Lou Hammer, and Prathia Hall. He asks, have we lost our passion for helping the poor and the downtrodden? Are we more interested in helping people get their praise on more than getting schools improved, getting levels of poverty around the churches reduced, the rate of divorce lowered, and getting more black men in the school and out of prison? McMichael suggests, that in the face of this current world and all that is happening, it is shocking to note that the voice of the prophet is too rarely heard. That biblical texts taken from the prophetic corpus, often employed in weekly sermons, soon are oftentimes not found. He suggests that maybe we only preach from the prophets periodically, maybe from Isaiah and Michael, when we want to demonstrate that the birth of Jesus was foretold hundreds of years, we preach only from Malachi, when we preach about an occasional sermon on tithing and promise that God will open the windows of heaven. 
We may hear a sermon about Zachariah on Palm Sunday when we tell the story of Jesus triumphantly entering into Jerusalem amidst the shouts of Hosanna. But when was the last time our congregation has heard sermons based on the book of Obadiah, Nahum, and Michael, and Haggai, and Zephaniah. Matt Mickle says that one of the problems in the 21st century is that preaching, and in particular, preaching in the black church, has shifted away from justice and righteousness to getting your praise on. He says, yes, there's a need for praise. It helps us to cope with and confront the problems in our community. But he also goes out on the limb and suggests that praise won't solve all your problems. And that certainly seems to be evident in the text because the priests were leading praise and worship. But the people were still plagued by the infestation of the locusts. Come on and look at them. They were shouting on Sunday, but plagued in their community with gun violence and multiple shootings on Monday. They were lifting their hands in worship on Sunday, but standing in the unemployment line on Tuesday. They were sowing seed at the altar on the Sabbath, but were unable to reap a harvest from their own fields. They were leading children's ministry, but losing their own children to the streets. They were serving in ministry, but then suffering mentally. Oh, but the good news of the text is that there is a man of prophet who shows up at the minister's conference and affirms the need for authentic worship, but declares that the priestly must be balanced with the prophetic. Thus Joel comes on the scene and he proclaims his message. But I've got to tell you tonight that his message was not a popular message. But while other preachers were preaching the best is yet to come, Joel preached the worst is on his way. Needless to say, this kind of preaching won't get the pastor raised. This kind of preaching will not get you elevated in your denomination. This kind of preaching is not the kind of preaching where people run up and throw seeds at the altar. Nobody stood up to preach and to push Joel when he started preaching. Not a single amen came from the audience. This kind of preaching will cause church leaders to call a closed meeting. This kind of preaching can cause your salary to be cut. This kind of preaching can cause your attendance to drop on Sunday morning and your anniversary to be postponed. This kind of preaching won't get you engagements, will cut out your revivals and get you blackballed by the circuit. Whoa, but thanks be unto God. When he went to the minister's conference, he held up his hand and said, hold up y'all. Don't dismiss me too early. Be careful that you don't put, don't put me out too quick. Hold up, y'all. Make sure that you don't close down on me too quickly. I know the message does not set well with you. I'm aware that the message is not good for you because here you are already going through. But Mr. and Mrs. Priest, before you sign off on me, allow me to share that that's just one side of the equation. Yes, I've come to tell you some bad news. The worst is on its way. But on the other side of the coin, there is some good news. If the priests will go back home, gather the people together, and sound the alarm. If the priests, when they leave Hampton, will go back to their communities, call the community together, blow their trumpet in the holy mountain, and call people to repentance, I said, there is another side of the equation, and that is good news. If the priest would dare go back home, lift up his trumpet, rend the hearts of the people, and tell the people it's time to come back to God. If the priest would do what the priest has been called to do, then I've got a feeling 
that in the midst of the rumbling with a smoke filled atmosphere at the sound of the alarm if the priests will go back home and do like the prophet said cry loud and spare not lift up your voice like a trumpet in Zion show my people their sin and the house of Israel their transgression if you go back home and call a sacred fast the Bible says who knows God may be merciful because you do understand that his mercies are new every morning you do understand what grandmama said mercy suits my case is there anybody who's come to the 103rd annual session at Hampton who knows anything about mercy is there anybody who's ever had to cry like David have mercy on me oh God according to your loving kindness according to the multitude of your tender mercies blot out my transgression is there anybody who knows anything about mercy then you ought to lift your hands and thank God for his mercy but hold up before you sign off on me God has something else to say he said I will restore to you the years that the swarm and locusts has eaten I will restore to you the years that the hopper the destroyer and the cutting locust has eaten I will restore to you the years now I don't know about you but that sounds like grace to me but I ain't surprised because anytime you find mercy you must understand that grace is somewhere close by because mercy and grace are inseparable twins thank God for his mercy mercy withholds what we deserve mercy says we deserve the worst but then God acts like an eternal crossing God steps out in the street holds his hands up stops the worst that's on his way puts up his eternal hand wave the blessings and say come on in mercy is what God withholds that we deserve but thank God for his grace his grace is what he gives us that we do not deserve and look at the text the text does not stop with God giving Judah mercy and God giving Judah grace but God gave them amazing grace he said I will restore the years it's right there amazing grace he promised to restore the years he does not stop at restoring what the natural disaster had taken from the people he goes as far as to give them back their grain their wine the fat of the land but he does not stop at giving them back what they lost he said I will restore the years which suggests to me that when God says that I will restore the years he says I will work in the impossible because with man it's impossible to regain time money can be restored property can be restored broken down cars can be restored whole houses can be restored relationships can be restored but I heard somebody say that time flies and does not return years pass and you can't get them back Benjamin Mays said it like this I only have just a minute only 60 seconds in it forced upon me 
can't refuse it didn't seek it didn't choose it it's up to me how I use it must suffer if I lose it give an account if I abuse it just a tiny minute but eternity is wrapped up in it and God has promised to redeem the time God has promised to restore the years that the swarming locust has eaten up which says to you and says to me if you showed up at Hampton coming out of rumbling if you showed up at Hampton and your foundation was being shaken if you showed up at Hampton barely escaped the signal of the smoke even if you showed up and a volcano has just erupted in your ministry God told me to tell you there is good news because he's able to step in your situation and turn things around for there's nothing too hard for God he's able to handle your problems he's able to fix your situation he's able to turn around your difficulty and that is the prophetic message when you go back to your church and people in your spews have been going through a shaking and a rumbling you can stand and tell them if you come back to God he's able to turn things around thank you Joel thank you for the hope but Joel I can't stop here because there is another mountain and on that mountain there's some shaking going on there is another mountain and on that mountain there is some rumbling there is another mountain maybe I ought to tell you this there are discretion advice because this mountain got ugly this mountain started looking bad on this mountain somewhere about noon there was an eruption the earth started shaking bodies came out of the ground the sun stopped shining the moon changed colors time collided with eternity bc met ad yes on that mountain it got ugly for on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross the emblem of suffering and shame on that mountain the son of god gave his life for the redemption of time on that mountain when the earth started shaking he died hung his head in the locks of his shoulder they buried him but thanks be unto god he wasn't frozen in the grave because early 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 sunday morning he got up and when he got up he got up with all power in his hand good evening may the lord bless you real good but if you preach prophetically you can leap priestly if you preach prophetically you can tell people there's a good reason to give God praise there's a good reason to celebrate for I celebrate that the spirit of the Lord is upon me he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor he sent me to heal the brokenhearted to preach deliverance to the captive recover of sight to the blind set at liberty them that were bruised preach when you go back home preach walk like a priest but preach like a prophet yeah preach and tell men and women 
boys and girls that there is good news because one of these days crime is going to cease wars will be no more one of these days we'll beat our swords in the plowshares our spears in the pruning hooks nation shall not lift up sword against nation and we'll study war no more one of these days every valley shall be exalted every mountain and hill shall be made low crooked places and crooked people shall be made straight rough places plain and the glory of the Lord shall reveal it yeah yeah yeah, there is good news. There's a rumbling, there's a shaking, there's a moving. I got a feeling that God is getting ready to turn some things around. Anybody in the house need him to turn it around? Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, oh neighbor. I got a feeling that he's turning it around and around and around and around. Say it. Say it. Yeah. He's turning it around for me. He's turning it around for you. And good news, you don't have to wait till he turn it. You can praise him. All credit. Say yeah. 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 For he's worthy to be praised. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, my soul cries out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I thank him for turning it around for me. Say yeah, 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 Shout around and around and around. Say For power and prophetic preaching like that, we're going to ask that you wait for the prophetic benediction. Amen. That we leave here in the same spirit that we're here. In the Jesus name. Turning around for me 
around for me around for me y'all know that come on around for me he's turning around for me what happened sooner or later it's gonna work in my favor yeah why it's turning around for me oh my sooner or later sooner or later it's working my favor everybody say it's turning around You just say hallelujah. There's a sweet spirit in this place. And I believe, I know, it is the spirit of the Lord turning around for me. Somebody who's come to this place this week, you won't have to go back like you came. God said, I just sent the, the warning signs to indicate that if you turn around, I'll stop the worst from coming. And I'll wave blessings your way. He says, I only sent the, the rumbling. I only allowed the locusts to come to get your attention. And if you go back home and tell people that if they would confess their sins and turn back to God, God will turn some things around. And my prayer tonight, my benediction tonight as you leave this place, that you will leave with a renewed determination to live your life and to serve in your ministry with the kind of courage to preach a gospel that people desperately need to hear that if my people who are called by my name if they'd humble themselves they pray if they seek my face if they turn from their wicked way God says I'll hear from heaven and I'll heal the land as you leave this place tonight go under the power and the unction of the Holy Spirit of the one who promised us that he would never leave us that he would not forsake us but that he is with us always why don't you hug somebody next to you tell them God's turning it around for you God bless you. Depart from this place, but never from his presence. Amen. Turn it around.